It is all KU because of UT's loss. The Jayhawks clinching a share of the 21st Big 12 title by beating Texas Tech on Tuesday night. And now, with that result, it's theirs alone. By their standards, struggled in that 20-21 season, but since then, a natty last year, and then winning the conference outright in what many consider to be the best conference in the country. All right, to get us ready for KU and other things tonight, we've got our insider Gary Parrish and our bracketologist Jerry Palm. All right, so the first two topics, we're going to have Gary go first, and then Jerry, I'll have you follow. Gary, we talk about KU, you know, they had that three-loss streak, and since then, just one loss against Iowa State. They've rebounded well. It's another conference title for Bill Self. Uh, how do you best describe what KU is doing at the moment? It's incredible, and I don't think it's something that should be taken for granted. I mean, Bill Self lost four of his top five scores, six of his top eight scores, including two first-round NBA draft picks from last season's team that won the NCAA tournament, and here they are again competing for a national championship, obviously going to be a one seed in the NCAA tournament and already wrapping up, again, that 17th Big 12 title under Bill Self. That's 17 in 20 years. I always throw this fact out there just because I think it, it provides uh, some context for, for what we're watching. Mike Krzyzewski is widely regarded as the GOAT of men's college basketball coaching. He was at Duke for 42 years. He won 13 ACC titles, 13 and 42. Bill Self has 17 in 20 in the Big 12. And I know that historically somebody might want to argue, well, the ACC in a different time was better than the Big 12, but the Big 12 has been one of the top two teams for the most part for most of the past decade. So what Bill Self is doing, simply put, I don't think will ever be replicated at the power conference level. And Kansas, undeniably at this point, has a chance to win back-to-back -back national championships with, with vastly different rosters. Not only that, Kansas is making a very strong case for the overall number one seed, even though the teams ahead of them, when the committee gave us their, their top uh, four seed back on February 18th, only Purdue was lost in front of them. Alabama's won all their games. Houston's won all their games. Kansas has got 15 quad one wins. 15. And now I realize it's because their schedule gives them so many opportunities, but you bet the strength of their league, you still have to win those games. It's remarkable the season that they're having, coming off a national championship, losing as much as they did, as Gary said, uh, to put together 15 quad one wins. That's got, I haven't checked, but that's got to be a record. And if it's not a record, Kansas will have that record shortly because that's a tremendous number. And KU second in the betting market at Caesar Sportsbook, guys, at eight to one, trailing only. Houston, Kelvin Sampson and his go Cougs remains the betting favorite to win the NCAA tournament. Now, Jerry and I have had this conversation before. Gary, again, I wonder what your thoughts are with Houston, which at times has been 6-1 to one or 7-1, to one, but the constant thing is they've been atop the betting board. By no means are they being disrespected in polls and such, but why do you think under some eyes and thoughts and opinions it doesn't exactly match what we're seeing in the betting market? Um, like, listen, Houston has been on paper a national championship contender since we knew Marcus Sasser was returning and Jarris Walker was enrolling, and they've done basically nothing to move anybody off of that. I know they got a goofy loss in there um, to Temple, but they've been excellent for for much of of this season, and you know they're never going to be able to match, at least while playing in the American Athletic Conference, a great Big Twelve team quad one win for quad one win or a great big 10 team quad one win for quad one win but against the schedule that's been placed in front of them they've done re incredibly well and all of the computers highlight that you know according to ken palm uh, there's only one team in the country that is top 15 in both adjusted offensive efficiency and adjusted defensive efficiency and that is kelvin sampson's houston cougars and they're top five in both so no matter what you like Houston has it, except for the strong conference affiliation and the strong conference schedule. They have a Hall of Fame caliber coach. They have NBA talent. I think two first-round picks on the roster. They've got experience. They're good offensively. They're good defensively. Right now, I would agree with the betting markets. If I had to pick one team to win the national championship, I would pick Houston. Now, I would take the field over Houston. I would take the field over anybody. But if you made me pick one school... I would pick the University of Houston. 
Yeah, the Cougars are having a tremendous season. They don't have the schedule of any of the other contenders, uh, with the exception of maybe the Pac-12 teams, at least at the top. But they are the number one team in most of these computers, if not all, and certainly the ones like the Ned and Ken Palm and Sagarin that are heavily influenced by margin of victory. They're the number one scoring margin team in the country by three points a game over number two. So they're doing what they can to dominate their schedule. And when you have a schedule like this, the only way you can impress the committee is to really dominate it. And the committee has been impressed. They were the number two team when they gave us the top four back on February 18th. So uh, Houston's having a tremendous season. They're very difficult to judge against these other teams because of the schedule differences. But like Gary says, this is a definite national title contender. All right, Cougars favored by 16 and a half at home against Wichita State. I got it at 17 and a half, so the number is going down. All right, we're going to get to as many as we can here. And now this time, Jerry, you're going to go first, and Gary, you're going to follow. So, Jerry, Wisconsin, one of your last four in, a big opportunity tonight against fifth-ranked Purdue. Yeah, really the reason why Wisconsin is a bubble team at all is because they have not been able to win games on their home floor. I think they're 4-5 and five against teams above you know quad four in as on their home court it's just really weird but tonight they get purdue purdue that's a house of horrors for purdue they're like three of uh, of their last 10 wins at wisconsin and purdue struggling so it's a great opportunity for wisconsin to try and get their best win of the season and really make a statement for the committee that they belong in this tournament but even if they beat purdue there will still be work to be done for wisconsin to stay in the field Wisconsin also has terrible computer numbers. They're 75th in the net right now, just 10 and 11 in the first two quadrants. They have a quadrant three loss as well. They do have six quadrant one wins, which is good for a bubble team. Tonight, if they could get it, would would make seven. But this is hugely important. And normally in a different time, you would think, okay, uh, Wisconsin at the Kohl Center, this is a good spot for them. But like Jerry laid out, they haven't been very good there uh, this season. So this is a big, big game in the Big Ten. Wisconsin needs it to to stay on the right side of the bubble. Perhaps, certainly, it would enhance the resume, make them safer entering the the uh, Big Ten tournament. And if Purdue were to take another loss, I don't want to speak for Jerry, but the Boilermakers could be at risk of of maybe losing a number one seed that seemed maybe not locked up, but but more likely than not, just a few weeks ago. All right, guys, let's go to the first four out category. We saw, you know, Penn State, of course, get that win at Northwestern in overtime on the road. Arizona State in action tonight. First game since that buzzer beater at Arizona. And Jerry, another chance to upset a top 10 team on the road tonight in Westwood. Yeah, well, first Penn State, that was an enormous win for them. Coming off blowing a 19-point lead at home to Rutgers and looking like their season was now dead, you know, that just breathes new life into them. They get Maryland at home, the Big Ten tournament. There's still hope for Penn State, but they've got work to do. Arizona State, same way. I mean, their, their schedule is a lot of hit and miss and, and too much miss at this point. Uh, and the Pac-12 doesn't give them as many chances, but you get UCLA, you get USC. They're both road games. So, you know, you have an opportunity to resume build a rare time to resume build in the Pac-12. But this weekend is a huge opportunity for Arizona State. Yeah, Jerry mentioned the next two games for the Sun Devils, both on the road in Los Angeles. They'll be underdogs in both. Bigger underdogs at UCLA than at USC, but underdogs in both. And that's one. Listen, if you're Bobby Hurley, you're you're thrilled to be in this position. Like, it's in front of you. It's attainable. But you're still on the wrong side of the bubble heading into two games to close the regular season that you are projected to lose. That's not a great place to be. Um, I, I think Arizona State obviously has a chance to make this NCAA tournament. But uh, anything worse than a split over the next few days is going to be problematic and leave them with some significant work to do in the Pac-12 tournament. We saw that buzzer beater once again. The Sun Devils were catching 12 or a Baker's dozen, and of course they come out with the victory. Speaking of Arizona, Jerry, you referenced the Pac-12 as a whole. Where ASU benefits from a win against Arizona. Arizona gets docked for a loss against an ASU. So at, at one point in the season, you had them as a one seed. You dropped them all the way down to three. They do have a regular season game with UCLA, potentially then again in the conference tournament. What's the ceiling for Arizona in terms of seeding the rest of the way? You know, it's hard for them to reach a one. I don't want to say impossible, but it, I think it's going to be hard, even if they beat UCLA twice, because, you know, we've seen them win games like that. They've got five wins against teams in the 
top now 30 since Indiana lost the other day uh, of the net, but all five of their losses are to teams ranked below 50 in the net. I mean, that's just remarkable. It's, you know, what, I know the committee doesn't overemphasize, you know, your losses, but that really stands out as a team that, you know, isn't always focused when it needs to be focused. And I, you know, it's going to be hard for Arizona to, to when now you're competing with, you know, Kansas and Texas and Houston and all those teams, and you've got five losses that are worse than probably, you know, most of the losses that those teams have. It's kind of hard to make the case for them as a one. Yeah, Jerry and I are on the same page here. I would have Arizona as a three right now, and they can get to a two, but trying to get to a one, when you've already got three losses outside of the first quadrant, that becomes really, really difficult. Like, let's see. If they run the table, maybe we revisit this and have a conversation. But if I'm Tommy Lloyd right now, I I think I'm probably at best a two seed on Selection Sunday and perhaps at worst a four. Lastly, guys, real quickly here, uh, FAU is in action at Rice. They're laying a bucket, but at large chances for the Owls because they're grouped in with the likes of Charleston and Oral Roberts there, Jerry. Yeah, and Charleston is not an at-large candidate, and I wrote about that yesterday at length. There's nothing for Charleston, but you know, Oral Roberts would be interesting. They don't have much at the top part of their resume either, uh, but they've been pretty dominant, at least in their league. And Florida Atlantic has been great in the computers, um, but they also, their, their best wins are North Texas twice, Uh, They split with UAB. They won at Florida. That's not a tournament team. They lost at Mississippi, which is not a tournament team. So there there really isn't much meat on the Florida Atlantic resume. Uh, And if they take another loss, which makes them an at-large team, man, they'd have to lose to to one of those two to have any hope at all. And, And even then, they may not make it. It is the name of the game, but you could have these schools right around 30 wins and not get in if they don't get that AQ. Our thanks to Jerry Palm and Gary Parrish. Guys, certainly appreciate it. Gary, part of the Ion College Basketball Podcast with Matt Norlander. It's all revving up. We're already in conference tournament time as we get to some of the big boys. And then, of course, the first two rounds of the tournament happening soon. And then we've got the Bracket Games. Join our CBS Sports HQ Bracket Challenge. All you got to do is scan that QR code. Uh, JD, by the way, how good are you at picking brackets? Have you ever won one before? Um, you know, I'm a little hit or miss. It okay. just depends. I think maybe some days, I'll do some multiple. Some years are good, yeah. You know, better's your odds, right? Yep. <laughs> do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis. No yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.